Good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today and our panelist discussion on sustainability and conservation in tourism. Thank you for so much for joining us. We're going to get started here in a moment, but I'll give a quick intro while everybody is entering the room. Uh, I'm Tad Bradley, the North American sales representative for Tropic Ecuador. I'm based in Seattle, and from our registration list, we have quite a collection of attendees from across North America and Europe and, of course, in Ecuador. But today we'll be discussing a few topics which really lie at the core of what makes Tropic Ecuador Tropic, um, and it's at, at the core of its ethos. It's sustainability, conservation, and community-based tourism. And we'll also be discussing the very real impacts that tourism has on a destination and on people and what our responsibility is or what it should be um, and our commitment um, as a travel industry as a whole, as, as a company and as individuals, both individuals in the travel industry and, and individual travelers. Just a little bit of history on Tropic. Before Tropic became Ecuador's premier boutique DMC and tour operator, Tropic was really born deep in the jungles of the Ecuadorian Amazon offering very adventurous camping expeditions in partnership with the Warani people. Jossi often refers to himself and his partners in those days as, as the jungle boys. And these, uh, and they truly were um, real adventure travel in those days. These um, camping expeditions eventually evolved into the award-winning Warani Eco Lodge, which many of you probably have visited um, and certainly have fond memories of, or at least are aware of. The, the Warani Lodge went on to win the National Geographic World Legacy Award for engaging communities back in 2015. And sadly, as, as many of you probably know, uh, due to the pressures of extractive industries in the Amazon, the lodge was forced to close in 2017. But through the legacy and the learnings uh, and the experiences from a decade working with the Warani in the Amazon, Tropic has carried these experiences and these ideas to other parts of Ecuador, establishing and helping promote community-based tourism experiences uh, and properties like Magic Galapagos on Santa Cruz, uh, as you hopefully know about, and the, also a giant tortoise reserve as well, doing some amazing conservation work there, uh, as well as the incredible May I Introduce You To programs, which hopefully you all watched that great webinar, that webinar last week that Diego and Jossie presented and highlighting their work with local artisans and entrepreneurs and musicians and other um, people that your travelers are able to engage with and, and connect with when they visit Ecuador. I could really go on and on and talk more about Tropic and their history and all of the, um, the work that they do from a conservation and sustainability and community-based tourism side, but I would like to really to get to our panel of guests who are the, the real experts in, in all of these topics. So I'm speaking of our guests, I'm, I'm joined by some familiar faces today from Tropic, Jossie and Diego, and then one who may be, for some of you, a new face you get, to, you get to meet. But first, we will be joined by Diego Escobar, who's Tropic's commercial manager. If you've been part of uh, Tropic's series of webinars, you certainly know Diego's face and voice and his knowledge uh, of Ecuador very, very well. Um, prior to joining Tropic, Diego actually worked um, and had years of experience working with the Quechua communities in the Yasuni National Park in the Ecuadorian Amazon while he was on the team of the Napo Wildlife Center, which is one of our favorite eco lodges in the Amazon and is importantly for this conversation, 100% uh, community owned. Diego is also involved in community and conservation work in the Chaco Cloud Forest north of Quito, which was recently declared in 2018 as a UNESCO bio, uh, biosphere reserve for its community and conservation efforts and its global bio biological significance. You'll also be hearing from someone you probably don't know at all. Um, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't been really getting out there during this, during this uh, lockdown. Tropics general manager and longtime community and conservation-based travel advocate, Joss Ivan Carvalho. Um, of course, I'm joking about that. If you've missed Jossi in the last three months, you, you haven't been paying attention. But Jossi has spent his entire career, which is over two, get two decades, uh, working alongside communities from the Amazon with the Warani to the Galapagos and, and everywhere in between in Ecuador and beyond, and really focused on creating these ecotourism experiences which empower local communities while also helping to protect their culture and protect the environment that they live in and that we travel to as, as visitors. And finally, we'll be joined by Jeppe Klockerson, founder of Fair, Trade, uh, Fair Travel in Sweden and a partner of the Global Sustainable Travel Council. And he will come in, uh, and share his thoughts from the point of view of an international tour operator 
and really as someone who is an incredible expert in this, in this field and who's dedicated his entire career to promoting sustainable travel. So that's our panel. We're gonna have a few photos um, that are gonna be uh, um, revolving around behind our, our panelists as they speak to give you some idea of some of the experiences in Ecuador that we've all had um, from a community-based tourism and sustainable standpoint. If you have questions, we're gonna do a Q&A at the end with all of our panelists, so feel free to enter them at any time in the Q&A um, section on your Zoom control panel. But let's get going with this. You don't really wanna hear me talk anymore. Uh, let's get to the, the, the people that are living and debating and working on these sustainability and tourism issues on a, on a daily basis. And we're gonna start with, with Diego. Diego, I, I hope you're well. Um, love to hear how it's going in Quito. And we'll start with you with a question about, um, you know, kind of a basic question for any sustainability and community-based tourism um, product, but what role does tourism play then in the economic life of indigenous and Aboriginal communities from your experience working um, at the Yasuni National Park? So uh, over to you, Diego. Thank you, Ta. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here again in this webinar series, and I'm really glad to share with you one of our favorite topics, actually uh, sustainable development and ecotourism. And um, yeah, thank you for, for the kind intro. I used to work uh, some years with uh, Kichwa communities, especially the Anyangu community inside Nation, uh, Yasuni National Park. Uh, they have two eco lodges inside Yasuni National Park, Napo Wildlife Center and Napo Cultural Center. And I think that ecotourism is a really good alternative for them in terms of uh, economic development, of course, but the good thing of uh, ecotourism and sustainability is that um, it encompasses really well the three aspects of uh, economy, society, and environment. So in this specific case of, of the Anyangu community, of course, they, they created jobs around 200 people, 50 families of the community living just through ecotourism activities. Of course, uh, they welcome around uh, 3,000 travelers every year, generating profits. That, that is the objective for, of course, for them to, to live, uh, have a good life, contributing to the local economy. And that's not all. They also have invested in infrastructure. They are also driving innovation because they have um, uh, choose to have these solar panels instead of uh, regular uh, energy or electricity. And they have also came up with new ideas of how to, to create uh, tourism experiences that are authentic and that connects with uh, with the with the tourists. So it's really important in this case, as, as I was saying, Anyagu community is one of the best examples. They started 20 years ago, just with few cabins around uh, one of these um, uh, lakes in the Amazon. And now they have over 20 cabins, a big observation tower. So they have, of course, drive innovation here in the, in the Amazon. So another important aspect is that aside from, from the economy point of view, also uh, the environmental, they are protecting around uh, uh, 200 square kilometers of primary uh, forest in the Yasuni National Park. Uh, in this case, you can find endangered species like the giant river otters. There's family of giant river uh, otters living there in in Napa Wildlife Center near the Nyangu community. You can see some other species that are not available uh, outside their territory. So uh, tourism is a good way uh, to preserve the environment, to help the local people, and also to empower them. Uh, just the fact that uh, having foreign people visiting their community is a good way to empower the, the local people they have created a cultural center called Kurimuyu, where the women of the community, they manage this center, they, have the, they get the incomes from the center, selling handicrafts, showing their traditions, dances, uh, their local uh, clothing. So I, I would say that ecotourism is one of the best ways to preserve um, the, 
ethnic, these ethnic groups that are kind of isolated. And they had the right to hunt, for example, fish, log, um, cut the trees, but they, now they are just dedicated to ecotourism because they say that it's better to preserve, uh, for example, a giant river otter than to sell um, their, their fur. So, because it will create more uh, economic development for the future. So, yeah. Thank and, you. And, <laughs> and in terms of experiential activities that guests can have, um, how, you know, first of all, what are the, the cultural activities um, and, and the opportunities for visitors to engage on a real meaningful level with local communities and learn more about their lives? Um, and and also, you know, what kind of value does that present, both from a financial standpoint as well as uh, as a cultural standpoint for those local? People? Yeah, thank you. Ted. As I was saying, uh, they have this uh, cultural center where they have. Um, I think your dog has some uh, some opinions on that, uh, uh, yeah. Diego. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a wildlife. Yeah, that wildlife. we are live. So. <laughs> Sorry, sorry about those barkings there. <laughs> yeah, that is the, the biodiversity in, in the city. <laughs> but yeah, that, as I was saying, they have created this um, cultural center and that is a really good way to connect with the people. Here, you have the opportunity to take part in, a, let's say, a mystical ceremony called Guayusada, that is, the, the ancestral use of a leaf of the Amazon that they believe is a, a sacred leaf and they drink this every morning. They start around 4 a.m., uh, 5 a.m. in the morning uh, cooking this leaf and uh, they drink it. It has a lot of caffeine as well, but um, that is like the local energy drink. So all the visitors are welcome to these uh, ceremonies. So they can also connect with the local people, uh, the, the old women, the grandma cooking there, uh, ask them about their, their traditions. And it's not like a, a, just a, a touristy way that, that they do this just to welcome the visitors. This is a way to know their daily life. You can also visit a, a, a local family, um, play with, with the kids. Here in Ecuador, we have a famous local uh, game uh, is like Bali, but it's called Equa Bali. So in the afternoons, the community used to uh, play Equa Bali, and you can also join them if you want to share just a little bit uh, with them doing some some sports. And you can also go uh, to the local paths they have their their crops to see the cacao, the the cassava root, help them to 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 see. Well, before you go to cook, you can also help them in the kitchen, doing some traditional dishes like the maito, like the yuca or the, or the cassava root. And, and that's a way to engage with them. They all, with all these incomes of the tourism, they have created a local uh, primary school and a high school. So it's also possible to visit these uh, facilities, also help them. You want to do some um, volunteerism as well, helping with some English classes and have contact uh, with, the, with the local kids. So that is uh, definitely a good way to uh, protect the children, the community and engage in the, in the society with, with the visitors. So that is a, a unique and original experience that you can find with the communities. And for, for those that aren't able to get out to the Amazon, um, can you talk a little bit more? And to be honest, it was, it was a bit of a, a new uh, destination for me even, was the Chaco Cloud Forest, which is not far from, from Quito. And um, just talk a little bit about your work there. What I found interesting in doing a little bit of research on these UNESCO biosphere reserves is that it's not just about preserving a place that has incredible biodiversity. Of course, that's a big part of it, but um, it actually, you know, just looking at the UNESCO website here, there has, the reserve must serve the combined pur purposes of conservation, development, and, log and log logistic support. Um, it, it must give equal weight to the needs of natural biodiversity and to those of the communities who live there, encouraging dialogue for conflict resolution and seeking conservation and sustainability solutions. So this really, you know, that this particular 
Bios Biosphere Reserve plays right into what we're talking about today and how critical it is to make decisions um, on in terms of sustainability and conservation in conversation with local communities. And I know you are part of that conversation. So maybe just to finish up here with a, a short description about what that was like and what you did um, in those um, with those conversations. For sure. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, the, the experience in the Chocó uh, was a little bit different because here you don't have uh, as so many ethnic groups, but you do have local people. So we also involved the local people developing and working in uh, tourism projects and ecologies. As you said, the Chocó is also a biosphere reserve as well as Yasuni. So uh, here what we were looking for is to integrate of these uh, sustainable axes uh, like uh, uh, local economy, economy, society and environment trying to, to reduce the, um, the consum consumption of energy, try to get uh, local ecological friendly options. And uh, it's also a good way for them to be uh, more related to, to the government, uh, working together in, in local projects, protecting the forest. Here, there is a big threat of uh, logging. So they have found a new way of living, protecting the forest, showing them to the, to the tourists. And uh, as I, I was uh, saying also, um, uh, giving them good, uh, of course, good working conditions. And at the end, they are the ones that are going to take the, the control over the tourism projects because they are, uh, most of them, the owners of, of the territory inside the, the biosphere, uh, the Chocó Biosphere Reserve. So once again, again, we have some examples all over Ecuador about these small initiatives working with local communities and tourism is a great alternative. Now with the current uh, pandemic situation, they are suffering, of course, because there is the, the lack of, uh, of uh, visitors coming in and they, they don't have enough uh, income. So I think uh, I, this is a good opportunity for all of us to try to, to help um, and help recover the tourism industry by choosing these local ecologies and local initiatives. Excellent. Yeah. Diego, thanks very much for diving into some of your past work. We're going to jump over now to, to Jossie. Um, and Jossie, I've been in many, many a presentations with you for in our six years working together. Um, and one of the things you always say is that Tropic's whole reason for being is to use uh, tourism as a tool for conservation. I thought maybe you could explain a little bit more about that, that ethos. I mean, I think that is the core of Tropic and you can explain more about that ethos and, and what do you consider the role for conservation in terms of um, how it is part of the mix in, in conserving natural areas as well as um, natural heritage and culture? That's cool. Thank you, Tad. Good morning, Diego. Good morning, Tad. Good afternoon, Yepe. Uh, it's great to have you guys here. Thank you so much for organizing another get together and this conversation and, and for the folks that are joining us today as well. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, that jungle boys, I still carry my, my spear, my Waurani spear everywhere I go. Now it's really useful for social distancing. So you can measure really for people not to get close to you. So it's fantastic new way of using the, <laughs> the, my, my Waurani spear. And um, I think before we, we get into this uh, incredible, and I, I really love the, the, topic, the, the topic that you guys chose. I want to let you know that Ecuador is opening up a little bit, as you probably saw on our news from last week. It seems like uh, um, we are getting to, to a new phase of, of this pandemic here. Uh, the society is up in, opening and loosening a little bit of these lockdown restrictions we've been living. And with that, we're seeing, and I think there is some happiness going on in Europe. I think Yepe can give us a little bit of, of what's happening now, but, but we're seeing a lot of interest now in terms of leads coming in and some bookings. So I feel like this is a good moment to talk about uh, uh, on how to restart our businesses and re-engage in the sort of products and, and, and the sort of commitment we should do to our businesses as well as to our clients uh, and the impact these first decisions we're making on this new moment of our businesses can make 
in destinations like Ecuador. Uh, Diego, is, 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 is always good to have this kind of the aspirations of a community tourism initiatives uh, uh, like the ones in the Amazon with Napa Wildlife Center and, and many other examples we have. But the truth and the fact is that right now and for the last three months, these communities haven't got any business whatsoever, right? So all of the cash flow going into these um, uh, areas, remote areas that were facilitating for all of these beautiful things that Diego was describing to happen uh, are not actually happening right now. So we've been seeing on the news and watching closely, myself personally, uh, the levels of deforestation, you know, going through the roof all over the Amazon rainforest in the region. Um, wild meat becoming again popular, you know, the trading of wild meat, people not having the money to go to the super or to the markets uh, close to their communities. Now, there are obviously these illegal trading markets of wild meat going on. Uh, I just read during this weekend that WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, Society did a study on, on the population of primates, and we're seeing these populations going down again. So it feels like all of this, this pandemic is not, is not only a nightmare for all of us, but, but it also has consequences around the environment and, uh, and obviously the impact of, of work that we've been doing for 20 years in, in conservation. And, and using tourism as a tool for conservation, Ted, I mean, it's because I'm completely useful for other stuff. I felt like, well, maybe tourism can be used as a tool for conservation because the conservation work that the scientists are doing, you know, uh, wildlife uh, uh, conservationists or, or people studying plants and, you know, biologists, all of this fantastic world uh, around the science, it's, it's not for me. So when I, when I went to the Amazon to try and help the world, I need people to, to figure how to fight destructive industries away from their territory. It could be either by using this beautiful spear here, which I'm completely useful at, uh, or you know, trying to create some other sorts of of, of ways to to bring this message out, right? And 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 what better thing than tourism, right? To bring the word out, you know, to be able to share uh, other people's uh, realities, experiences, and countries and destinations. So so we felt that you know, tourism is not only a fantastic uh, way to share, but also a fantastic way to bring people in, open their eyes. By having those experiences right so and we we managed to create this beautiful model and it's actually a very simple model because in a way tourism generates many opportunities in terms of business right but it also generates a lot of responsibilities uh, and we when it comes to our natural and cultural heritage specifically going going to your question right so so first recognizing that both uh, nature and culture are not only resources they are there for us to use right these, these are not just elements that we can bring to our business models this this is our role it begins with incorporating those elements into our business plan right and this is what we did in the beginning we recognized that without them we didn't have any business whatsoever right so so we depend uh, on these resources on on the culture and the nature of areas like especially in countries like ecuador to attract visitors to our destinations and and we depend on the local communities to protect them but also to feel empowered and included and benefit from from this business right so and that's when all, this whole model and this virtual circle of conservation starts uh kicking in because people see oh my god i'm protecting this tree and, and i'm actually making money out of protecting this tree right so that's a, is an incredible thing to happen. Uh, so once we understand this, uh, that we have partners and with those partners, we can do wonders that, you know, it's, it's a game changer. And that was a game changer for Tropic in Ecuador. So we have examples today and success stories of how we have incorporated communities and natural areas, private or public. Uh, we have supported development of accommodations with local communities like the Waurani, the Sequoia people. Uh, you know, it's been private or public or a mix of both. We have supported development of, uh, you know, other local communities, not around accommodation because that's not only, not only that. So going back to the may I introduce you to uh, programs that we have, you know, cooking classes with local families, excursions with a focus on handicrafts and artwork, adventure and exploration and complex logistics in remote areas, only possible with local support, you know. I, if I want to do a, a, an expedition deep in the Amazon rainforest, we are absolutely useless in the Amazon rainforest. So we would always need the support from the locals to be able to get and deliver those, those experiences and logistics, right? And the result overall is unique 
exclusive, exclusive experiences for our clients with positive social and economical impact, right? That's kind of the bottom line. And uh, considerable contributions to environmental conservation and cultural appreciation of, of, you know, and the celebration of this culture. So our role is to continue leading this movement uh, with the support of obviously all of our partners abroad. I like, Jossie, you know, you're talking about or your statement about that um, nature and culture are not just resources us for uh, resources for us to to use and, and exploit that again this is this is a partnership and and ultimately we we absolutely have to engage and connect and work together with local communities and local people to to have these experiences be meaningful and sustainable in, in the long term um, well in the short term and the long term um, what do you think I mean given the current situation the the pandemic that we're currently living how do you see um the, what are some opportunities for cultural and nature uh, nature tourism to emerge from this stronger what what can be what can we be doing now in preparation for um you know the restart of tourism um to come out of this stronger and to be de delivering a more even more meaningful um tourism experience from a cultural and sure. natural perspective yeah yeah well, I think that first of all, we have to define the situation with the present, right? We're in lockdown for almost three months now. You can clearly see that with my beautiful new looks, you know, and we'll be undergoing social distancing for a while. So this is kind of the current context, right? So, and we are social creatures, Ted, right? So we, we are desperate to go out and reconnect with our loved ones and ourselves with nature. So that's kind of the, the, the current situation we're living right now. So for me, it's really hard to, to imagine people postponing for much longer their travel dreams after this experience, right? We need uh, something to look forward to. Uh, we will be pursuing ours and our beloved ones' well-being as well, right? We, we kind of moved after all of these uh, um, lockdown situation. Psychologically, it's been very hard for a lot of people, including myself. And we won't be pursuing only tick of a box places to show on Instagram. I don't think that's the deal anymore, right? Uh, I think that today, more than ever, the traveler will prioritize their time investments and the purpose of their trips. And I believe that unique and iconic sites, you know, that we have the luxury to have in Ecuador. Um, uh, and we are actually very fortunate to promote and, the, and we have the responsibility to protect will be extremely popular for what they mean to the world. So I think that's kind of the, the situation with us. And now the value, the value, will be in giving meaning to these experiences, right? Our ability to facilitate respectful, humane, sincere interactions. I consider that our clients today will be absolutely selective with the type of interactions they will be looking for. Uh, and this will be the new way of experiential travel from my perspective. You will be contributing to the world and I'm excited we can be facilitating those, this reconnection period. Before we, we head across the pond to, to Sweden, do you um, have any uh, experiences you can share about what you're doing right now with the communities during this, this time and, and how they're doing? I'm, I'm sure, as we all know, it's a difficult time for everyone, and in particular for these community tourism experiences and people involved in them. But what, um, tell us some stories about what's happening with, with uh, some of the, the, the people that you work with on the ground. Sure, yeah, well, Jungle Boys, right? <laughs> At Tropic, uh, you know, it's decades ago we defined the importance of responsible and sustainable tourism. You know, we've been talking about this forever. And despite the fact that this type of tourism has so far been seen as something for specific market niches, you know, compared to large cities or sun and beach destinations, today the dimension of looking for remote, you know, open space, small, locally owned and run accommodations far from cities and agglomerations, will be the new luxury. So I think we're, we're finally a trending topic, Ted. In addition, this global crisis has shown us the strength of nature to regenerate. And we hope that this does not remain as something nostalgic, right? That happened during the pandemic and that it becomes a real commitment by everyone to take care of the planet, uh, which will further highlight na natural wonders, right? I firmly believe that uh, a lot more appreciation will be, uh, appreciation will be given to the planet uh, and to our job as well in the travel industry. So I think it's, it's again, I'm very optimistic about this new moment and, and excited about uh, what, what uh, Yep is gonna share with us now. 
Well, that you don't need any further introduction yet, Bay. Um, you've you've heard from Jossie and and Diego from from the supplier side in Ecuador and um, the guys that are on the ground daily working with these communities and and debating these topics. Um, we'd love to get your perspective coming from the international tour operator, um, uh, just in general, and then maybe some thoughts on where you think we're headed. Um, you know, you um, you've got your finger on the pulse of the industry and on you know, these issues as relates to the industry. Um, do you see this sustainability as becoming and conservation and community tourism becoming much more integral to, to travel planning after we emerge from this? Um, we all hope so, but we'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this and to sharing um, at least my thoughts and, and ideas on this. And, and basically what Jasivan and Diego has covered here is, it, it's, it's, I mean, what else can I say? It, it's spot on. Um, one reflection that I was uh, thinking of uh, on what Jasivan was saying here at the end, regards to how we're sort of reconnecting back to nature. Um, obviously, I live in Sweden. We all know that Sweden has chosen a quite different path when it comes to this lockdown. It's, it's a much more lighter sense. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And we're not going to debate what was right, what was not. But what we've seen here in Sweden is how people have turned to nature. Uh, finding their way back to nature in a in a way like a solitude you know going back to something where they can feel safe where they can feel um, not being part of this hole where we have the disease going all the way around us so we see a surge in people looking for nature-based experiences here in sweden as well now of course this at this stage comes back to domestic tourism but I'm for certain that this will also reflect on international tourism. Sweden is a country with a population that is traveling quite a lot. And now we've been sitting here for what, three months, four months almost, haven't been able to move around. And people are getting, you know, itchy. They want to move, they want to travel. And, and now, as, as was mentioned before, that things are starting to slowly ease up and open up people are now starting to look um, beyond just traveling domestically. Europe is starting to open up slightly, and I can see that sales are starting to pick up a bit in Europe. I think the long haul travel will take a bit longer. Uh, I think a lot of the issues nowadays comes back to trust. Can we trust the destinations we travel to? Can we trust the partners that we choose to work with? Uh, are the safety and, and health regulations in place? These are the things that I'm picking up at this early stage. And I think it's also kind of imperative to look at the, uh, the guidelines that were released by the UNWTO last week, talking about the health and safety issues as being a priority, but they also maintain the aspect of sustainability. This is definitely an opportunity for sustainability to get that foot in the door and actually make a change. You asked me where I think that we are going. I definitely think that we are on the brink of a change in tourism. I, I've said over the past months that tourism as it was is, is slowly dying. I think that we're gonna see a new sort of kind of tourism, tourism 2.0 or something like that. A new kind of business model, which is less about the volumes and the small margins and more about the quality and also what both Jasivan and Diego cover about uh, what sort of local financial impact we can have on the places that we visit. I mean, look at the statistics that, not statistics, but at least the assumptions uh, that we're talking about a 60 to 80% drop in visitor numbers in 2020. Now that's a lot. But given the fact that there might still be some tourism coming through, make sure that that tourism is the right kind of tourism, the tourism that comes to the destinations that contributes to conservation and local empowerment. Diego covered women empowerment. These kind of aspects, those are so key and imperative at this stage. And also, I think it's choosing the, uh, the operators and destinations where you see sort of the spread of the tourism revenue going to many, involving many, 
uh, those are certainly aspects that are key in order to sort of highlight tourism as being successful. I think the local experiences that was presented by Diego and Jasvan are key. I mean, I just want to applaud what, what you're doing and what you're presenting here, because this is the kind of tourism that we need more of. This is also what the UNWTO is pushing for, saying these, this is, we are actually, yes, we're, we've got hardship. A lot of companies are going under and so forth, but now we must see the opportunity of changing this whole business model to something that is more sustainable. Here, here. Thank you, Yepe. This, um, I think we're going to open it up here in a minute or two to questions, but I, um, but I thought that we could, as a panel, um, jump take take what you just talked about, Yepe, and, and look toward the toward the future, um, and to also look inward to ourselves, as we as I led off with at the beginning, and to our companies, and to as an industry as a whole, and and talk a little bit about you know, what is our role in, in and how do we um, help to redefine and to drive tourism forward in a more sustainable fashion after um, the pandemic? Jossie, I thought maybe you could give us your, your thoughts along those lines as an, as an industry, as a company, and as, as individuals. Um, what, is, uh, what is our role in making sure that we see a, a new tourism, tourism 2.0, as, as Yepe called it? Actually yeah, happen. I love that, Yepe. I really liked it, Yepe. And I, and I also like the fact that we can be brave enough to decide what type of travelers we want back in our countries, right? And what, what is the type of future we want uh, for tourism to take on our destination, especially places like Ecuador, right? When, when it's all about nature and culture, when everything is so fragile, naive, and even, you know, uh, you know, so, so simple. It's a very simple lifestyle, right? So, and tourism can be very aggressive. So I really love that, uh, Yepe, and I'm, I'm, and I'm gonna write those words and I'm gonna try and be as selective as I can, but, it, but it's really about uh, all of us uh, getting together, right? I think that first of all, it's, it's important to keep that uh, hashtag, we are in this together in mind, right? I think that's uh, fundamental for all of us, uh, as responsible citizens, I think we all have a responsibility in our countries to be part of our comeback. I think that's, that's a way to, to start, right? Ours in Ecuador, Diego, I think is to help uh, generate in income to the most remote places where it's very difficult for our governments to get. You know, that's another element that we have, an additional problem we have in this country, that our government is completely bankrupt. So they don't have the capacity to go and lift these uh, rural communities on a very complex situation right now. So, so um, and this is where the most vulnerable uh, populations live, right? So we have also that responsibility to think about as an industry in Ecuador. And tourism, what I love about tourism is that tourism has the capacity not only to reach these remote places, but also to make contributions to poverty alleviation, uh, development of social entrepreneurship, right, in rural areas and make contributions to conservation, like I said before, or even generating incentives for conservation, right? So a tree is much more valuable standing than being sold illegally on, a, on some border of a neighboring country, right? So I think that's also key. But, but I think the most, the most beautiful concepts and, and, and reality of tourism is that uh, we can generate immediate income. Right. Tourism generates distribution of wealth immediately. Tourism generates jobs immediately. Tourism educates visitors and locals. And I think those, those are the beautiful things that happen in, around our industry, right? Tourism motivates the protection of mountains, um, our natural water reservoirs, as I keep saying, you know, each time that we go together tracking or climbing the mountains, these are, nat these are our na natural reservoirs of water that goes to big cities like Quito. Um, and tourism, tourism is, is the keeper of tropical mega diverse forests, you know, home of, of Diego and myself for, for many years. And obviously our oceans, when we think about the Galapagos and the Pacific Coast, you know, I can only think about tourism being, you know, a platform to promote uh, sustainability, sustainable fisheries and conservation of, of the underwater world. I think that tourism also does show alternatives to communities to develop their local economies, you know, talking about this comeback, you know, we can develop our economies in a more, in a more sustainable way. Uh, now the absence of income uh, put, 
fragile ecosystems in danger. As I was telling before, you know, we've been seeing on the news, there is a lot of threats and pressure now over these fragile ecosystems in the Amazon, for example. And I think also tourism can prevent immigration to the cities that generate poverty. You know, we'll be, we're going to be seeing a lot of that, I think, also. You know, people will start coming to the cities and the big cities are the, the, the hotspot for the pandemic uh, uh, growth, right? So it's another crazy deal that we have to think about when we're thinking about tourism. So we should go and develop in the rural areas. We should forget about the cities for a while, right? So I look to the future with great optimism. Uh, I see a lot of opportunities to continue sharing with my family and visitors from all over the world, the wealth we have, and take this responsibility with pride. You know, as, as you guys know, you, we've been very active uh, speaking about Ecuador and the beautiful things we do here. And, and I feel like we have to continue with that same energy, Diego. And I think we can make huge differences in our planet by promoting tourism as a tool for conservation, going back to your first statement, Tad. Diego, are you any anything to to add on to that before we go into uh, Q and A? Well, I would um, like to say that, yeah, I think tourism is changing now, changing really uh, rapid, and I'm really proud. I'm uh, a little bit biased here, but uh, it's not just about taking care of the environment, but for example. Uh, as tour operator, working closely with the guides, working closely with the drivers, service providers, taking the visitors directly to the workshops, to the artists, and that, that's also part of sustainability. And we always try to include these elements in, in our program. So uh, in the future, of course, everything is going to be more, more private, with uh, con more controlled conditions. But uh, I think as a, an outbound tour operator, uh, a good way to to do the sustainable job is to try to pick and choose a sustainable supplier. Of course, we cannot be sure of a hundred percent that everybody is uh, taking account these elements, but at least we try and it's uh, in our philosophy. So I hope in, in a near future, we have more of a, kind of these projects that that involves more of a community element, society and nature, of course. Yeah, Diego and, and Jossie, I think one question that we've got here is around um, health and safety, you know, in the midst of, as we're gonna be living likely with, with this for some time and the reopening that will begin, you know, in the midst of that. Um, in terms of health and safety for make, for visiting communities and, and not, I mean, yes, on the from the traveler's standpoint as well wanting to make sure that interactions are are safe um, but also from the community standpoint i know here in the states um, or speaking specifically to the state of washington there are some parts of the of the state right now that have very low case numbers and to be honest a lot of the, those areas who in the past have relied on tourism many of them don't want tourists right now coming from the the denser places uh, like the city of Seattle, for example. So there is this uh, bit of a, a push and pull here of needing needing tourism um, for their economies, but also being fearful or being concerned about inviting people in that may, you know, that may um, bring, you know, bring the the virus. So can you talk a little bit about how you we can respectfully um, work with communities on a health and safety standpoint, both for the travelers uh, that are visiting, but equally, if not more important, for those local communities who are welcoming um, people in from abroad and from elsewhere in the world? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, and that, that's a concern we all have. Uh, I mean, our operations team, uh, the, the, the most important task that they have had during these past three months has been to develop our post-COVID uh, operations protocol, right? So beyond the Rainforest Alliance certification standards that we have in place. Now we also have to think about those things, right? And one of the things that we've been doing a lot uh, once these protocols were ready, you know, several weeks ago, we, we, we are running several virtual trainings for guides and drivers because they are the ones really being the facilitators as we usually call them, like the guardians. They will be now the guardians of the communities and our clients also with this additional challenge. Um, I think the answer is that the most, I think the most direct answer is, is outdoors, right? We are going to spend a lot of time out. We don't want to 
we don't want to go to enclosed areas where where we're going to put in danger communities as well as our clients right so most of our activities and most of what we've seen is going to be very popular uh, are for example our, our trekking trips our large to large trekking trips right so in a way we will end up uh, our days being on on these hotels and all of the hotels now have these fantastic protocols the government's being very efficient at that developing and releasing all of these protocols for the different sectors of the of our industry so in one hand you have our local partners doing their homework and, and implementing best practices to protect their staff and our clients uh, but at the same time the relationship and the engagement with the community is going to be you know is always is always being kind of distanced you know because we are always very respectful to the day-to-day -day and their own space but i think that uh most of the things that we'll be developing and we are developing and are pretty much ready to be released are activities and and programs and experiences more uh in the outdoors right it's more is, is a lot more outside that's a great point yeah um we've got a few other questions but yep i know you wanted to, to to jump in here and chime in yes um basically first of all i'd like to say that it's impressive to hear what jasmine is saying in regards to all these protocols and guidelines being in place put in place by the government which which i assume and I think it's it's also important when it comes back to the destination, the responsibility of the destination. We're talking here about what should we sort of demand from, from the partners that we're working with and so forth. But we mustn't forget the importance of the responsibility of the destination, decision makers, politicians, and so forth. Making sure that things are in place because to just put the pressure on the industry themselves and for the operators to follow protocol and follow guidelines, it's so easy to sort of hand the responsibility over but in order to be successful long term we need to have a proper plan in place so i just wanted to add that but also i think what an operator sort of can do of course is be selective of who you work with and and trust it's all it, it comes back to trust but once once again i'd like to say the importance of, of having choosing the destination and make sure that the destination management is in place because you can put only put so much sort of responsibility on the operators themselves, but without the destinations making sure that there is that platform to build on, then it's, it's, it's really a challenge. Like I, I can see, once again, I can take something from Sweden, which is currently happening here as we're heading into summer and things are starting to open up. What they're doing is putting guidelines in the hands of, oper of activity companies, hotels, et cetera, et cetera, but they aren't the experts. So why don't make sort of assessments together with tourism professionals and health professionals to make sure that everything is in place to train them? Because without your training, how can you make sure that things work? Absolutely right. Yeah, great point, yeah. Chepe. Um, here's a question from Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia. What about education of kids, which is as she rightly points out our future um, and, and students um, I lost the question here, sorry. Um, do you have projects in combination uh, you know, with education and tourism and, and students? Our, uh, us as Tropic, no, we don't, we don't have uh, that sort of uh, line of our business that would dedicate to, to teach, even though we do run a couple of research facilities in the Amazon rainforest where we run more like research based on conservation and providing tools for the local communities to protect their forests. We are not really engaging at this stage with, with kids, you know, our future, I think is correct, Sylvia. I am dealing a lot with my own kids for three months. So I guess uh, I'm learning a lot from them uh, because we've never been together for so, so long and so consistent amount of time and, and hours and days. But um, I think it's very important. One thing that we do work uh, intensely is with our community of guides and drivers. I think I've said this before, you know, we have our own internal assessment of what is the weakest link in our, in our own community as an industry. And we always spotted that um, the guides and drivers, especially now, it proves my, my theory of years that they are probably a, a group of people that are very, on a very tough spot right now. They don't have any jobs. So, and they are, most of these guys are freelance people. So right now they don't have any income and we are having kind of weekly catch-ups with them. 
and we are trying to explain what's happening in terms of the industry and the world and opening up of the markets, et cetera, et cetera, kind of setting expectations as well as, well as when, where are we seeing the business coming back? But going back to, to the question is like, for us, that's kind of where our focus right now is, you know, and educating, not meaning telling them how to do their job, but for example, understanding what's going to be the trends, what type of clients are we're going to be getting, uh, what are these protocols and what, what's our responsibility towards, you know, helping, hotels de delivering or helping other suppliers delivering their job or themselves protecting themselves and our clients. So, so that's uh, where we're focused now. Silvia, we, as, as you probably know, we are more dedicated to, you know, we have this line of business working with artisans with the May introduce you to program artisans and artists and, and, and communities focus on art. And then we have the conservation initiative, right? And as you probably, Ted, you mentioned in the beginning, we haven't talked much about magic lately, but you know, our reforestation and the, and the reintroduction of the original habitat of the giant tortoises in, at the Galapagos magic is, is still going. So that's also where we're putting a lot of effort, uh, continuing with a project that started early in the year. Diego, do you have anything you'd want to add? Um, yeah, thank you, Sylvia on that yeah. side of, you know, from an educational standpoint, from, from well, Napo and your experiences. Yeah, there. yeah, for sure. Actually, it's kind of difficult for a tour operator, like work directly in, like, in, in education, but the way we help is like uh, using these uh, service providers, these ecologists, local communities, because we are helping, like bringing more visitors, bringing incomes, by this way, they are trying to keep their school, their high, high school paying teachers for them, uh, English teachers, etc. And that's a way to help to improve education in this rural area. So, uh, I mean, yeah, it's kind of difficult for us to, to be involved directly in, in education, but that is the way to help local communities so they can organize and educate its people. For example, it's really important uh, to take in, into account that uh, just in the case of, of Napo, for, for instance, um, there is a code that uh, provides uh, um, prohibits the, the um, I mean, they will um, like protect the children and adolescents for any kind of um, exploitation. So if they were not involved in tourism, maybe this would happen. So that is also a way to, to protect children and uh, secure their future. Jeppe, you wanted to jump in with some thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I wanted to flip it around more or less, uh, saying uh, you were talking about educating the, the kids here, but I was just wanted to mention an initiative that came along here in Sweden uh, as the COVID-19 outbreak came along. We had an educational uh, institution that uh, very, very quickly put together a 10-week course focused on sustainable tourism, aimed at tourism professionals. Uh, I think by the end, when it's uh, sort of the applications shut down, it, it was like 150 applicants or something like that. So nowadays we have 38, 39 something uh, tourism professionals now being trained in sustainable tourism, a 10-week program business learning program, putting their companies like in the aim, uh, making sure to create sustainability within that pro. So I think it's also imperative here to not forget about the importance of training the industry, the travel trade themselves to make the right choices, to make sure that they know what to look for at, and so forth. So uh, I know that Jasivan and Diego, they will do a guest lecture in front of these tourism professionals next week. That's why, yep. That's why I'm I'm leaving my beard. You know, I want to blend in with the, with the Nordic. Uh, the Nordics. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> but I, I think Yepe, you you hit on and and continued from from what Jassi and Diego were saying. But on an important part of this discussion, I think we'll finish up here. Is just the idea of our shared responsibilities throughout the value chain and the supply chain of of our industry. So it's not just. We're not, and again, going back to what Jossie said, that nature and culture are not just resources for us to use. So it's not just those local people and these local communities and these local experiences um, 
that it's not just their responsibility um, here. It's, it's all of ours from the, the person selling the outbound tour operator, as you say, that um, in, in Sweden or in elsewhere in, in North America and Europe. Um, it is the local supplier, it's the DMC in the case of Tropic, but it's also our partners, Tropic's partners um, with uh, hotel properties. Um, and then also, yes, these local suppliers and, and community-based tourism experiences. So we share a lot of responsibility. Everybody plays a very important role in this in this value and supply chain in how we can begin to reimagine tourism um, post pandemic and hopefully deliver even more meaningful experiences uh, to our guests, as well as meaningful experiences to to local people, um, as well as the economic benefits. Um, and we need to remember that all of us do play a role and and uh, as we as we look to reimagine tourism coming out of this. So I think we're almost to, almost to an hour. So we'll, we'll let it go at that. No more questions at the moment, but certainly uh, we are happy to field other questions after the fact if you have um, have those and you'd like to send them over via email. We'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar as as Diego and, and Jossie do a great job of after every webinar. You'll get to you'll get a link to this um, and um, and let's continue the conversation. This is just the beginning and um, hopefully we'll be able to put a lot of these sustainably sustainable practices um, in place very soon for your guests um, and uh, and with the local community. So any last words, um, panelists? Jossie, Diego, Yepe, anything you wanna say before we go? Be brave, don't go back to what was and chasing the, uh, the cheapest, be, be brave and be bold and go for quality and lower volumes. Cool. Here, here. Guys, you know, what else can, I, can be said, huh? Thank you very much for, for your time, uh, for sharing. Uh, we really appreciate to have uh, friends and partners like you all over the world. And I'm very excited about this new moment. As I said, we are being very optimistic and we're making the most of these opportunity to slow down and reconnect and re-engage with our, with our beginnings, right? Let's celebrate those Jungle Boys times now and, and share all across Ecuador. Thanks, Jossie. Here's to the, to the new beginnings and rebirth soon. Thanks for everybody for joining us. I'm Thank sorry, I, I forgot to, Thank you. to stream those pictures I promised you, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you didn't mind seeing all of our faces uh, instead. And um, we look forward to connecting with you in person, hopefully sometime very soon and taking care of your travelers even sooner. So take care, everyone. Awesome. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jossie. Thanks, bye -bye. Diego. Bye, Thanks, Bye, Bye, Diego. Gracias, Tad. Bye. Abrazos. Ciao.